11 News at Prime. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. I'm Cathy Muslatana. Plenty of reaction this evening to the Finance Minister's medium-term budget policy statement. We'll also then reflect on the passing of F.W. de Klerk. First, let's look at the Finance Minister's speech today. He says South Africa's economy is expected to recover faster than expected. Speaking during, he, during rather his maiden medium-term budget, he attributed this to uh, less strict COVID-19 restrictions, low interest rates, and the commodities boom. Godongwana says 5.1% growth is expected in 2021 from a 6.4% contraction last year. Notably, growth has recovered faster than employment. In the first half of 2021, the South African economy recovered more quickly than expected, reflecting less stringent COVID-19 restrictions, along with lower interest rate, support from strong international demand, and higher commodity prices. We now expect the South African economy to grow by 5.1% 5 5 in 2021 from a 6.4% contraction in 2024. Over the next three years, the growth of the local economy is expected to average 1.7%, reflecting some structural weaknesses such as inadequate electricity supply. Godongwana maintains that reforms need to be accelerated considering the country's economic outlook. He says the first priority will be to ensure stable electricity supply. Our first and immediate task in this regard must be to ensure stable energy supply, reduce the risk of long load shedding, and accelerate the transition to renewable energy sources. All of our efforts over the past 13 years have been to fix ESCOM. Instead of securing supply of adding additional capacity to the grid, we have already made significant progress in correcting this. The amendment of Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act of, of 2006 has raised the licensing threshold from one megawatt to about 100 megawatts. It has also made it possible for private power generation to sell directly to customers. This will alleviate the risk of power cuts. Well, let's get you reaction to the minister's medium-term budget. Joining us tonight to reflect on this speech, we're joined by political economist Daniel Silk, SMME Forum President Deborah Khas, and Youth Capitals Network mobilizer Leti Wengosi. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for your time. More broadly, it doesn't look like there were any big surprises coming out of this medium-term uh, budget policy statement. But, Daniel, let me perhaps kick it off with you and give us a sense of what you effectively take away from this afternoon's address. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, I didn't take away that much, to be perfectly honest. I think uh, the minister kicked the can down the road uh, to the main budget uh, at the end of February. It did look to me as though government was very unsure on a variety of issues, the broad policy front issues of social redress, the basic income grant, uh, the issues relating to a revenue collection and how sustainable that is. Uh, and of course, additional expenses when it came to ESCOM and the various other SOEs, these, you know, have been with us before, they were there today, they're going to be with us probably next year. And I think there was just too much uncertainty sort of uh, uh, really injected into this budget to make any good analysis of it, except to say that, uh, you know, the minister, it was the minister's first budget. Uh, it showed, I think, some continuity from the previous minister of finance. I think here is a, uh, you know, a, someone who's an ANC insider who I think uh, has his head screwed on correctly when it comes to understanding the challenges of the uh, policy paralysis that we have in South Africa and the effects on growth. But beyond that, I think that um, there was little to suggest that government has a grip on the vexed issue of growing the economy firstly, and obviously the issue of job creation, which in my mind is still the critical issue for us. Deborah, let me come to you. What's your reaction? Daniel, couldn't have... Um... Uh, summarized it uh, or captured it very aptly. In fact, uh, you would even if you close your eyes and maybe they even made the the voice 
constant. You'd probably think it was Tito Mbaweni or any other minister that spoke before. There, has, there was nothing really materially different from this uh, mid-term uh, budget uh, uh, state, um, uh, um, policy statement. Uh, it was just a repetition of, of what you had uh, in past statements, be they uh, budget statements or mid-term statements, with a sprinkling of this and other different uh, wording here and there. But otherwise, for all intents and purposes, for us, it is very disappointing, to say the least. Letty, of course, you are listening out for the interests of young people in this country. Anything that came out for you that suggested that um, we will be on a different trajectory that changes perhaps the lived experience and, and the outcomes that young people are currently subjected to? Thank you so much, Kathy. I think I want to pick up on what um, Daniel said about the absence of the mention of job creation. As youth capital, we feel like there was not a strong emphasis on youth unemployment and how that crisis of youth unemployment will be tackled. Uh, we do commend the minister's mention of the commitment towards public employment, but we believe that there's still so much work that needs to be done with in relation to public employment programs and how they are rolled out. And so we are eager to see how that commitment, the amount that has been allocated to public employment will really be spent to ensure that public employment opportunities are meaningful for young people. We also heard him speak a lot about economic growth. Um, and the need for South Africa to be well positioned to attract investors. But as youth capital, we feel as though economic growth without unlocking young people's potential um, is almost in vain. It's counterintuitive because opportunities or job, job opportunities may be created through our economy growing, but if young people's potential is not unlocked, for instance, if we don't address how much money young people spend to look for work, um, if we don't address the issue around skills development, then the opportunities that will be created through economic growth will not address the crisis of youth unemployment. Mm. Uh, Daniel, the finance minister spoke a lot about the need to um, unlock the policy framework in this country so that uh, economic growth can be ignited and to basically make it, make it easy for business to do business in, in South Africa. But beyond that, do you find that there's anything that he has mentioned that will set South Africa on a different growth trajectory than what we have been on? And the short answer is no, but I think that the, uh, the policy framework that we're currently in is not really the domain of the finance minister or frankly the domain of treasury, although uh, there perhaps are hints as to what they would like. The policy domain at the moment is uh, you know, at, at the behest of cabinet uh, and the broader, the broader ANC. And unless you have uh, an ANC that really understands uh, a modern economy, uh, what it uh, takes to be competitive, uh, and I absolutely agree with uh, my co-speaker on the issue of skills development and, and using reskilling in particular uh, to try and uh, move ourselves into a modern framework, unless you apply that in policy, and I might add, and I know it's more controversial, but unless you actually really open your arms to cooperation with the private sector. I must just say that the minister did stress this issue of private sector involvement, which is critical also for skills development as well, I might add. Um, but I just, don't, I just don't feel as though there's enough cohesiveness within the ANC um, from an economic policy point of view uh, to really present you know, a set of really 10 great principles or even three great principles that are likely to absorb you know, our 9 million young people in this country who are, who are out of work. So to me, the buck stops with the politicians and the buck stops in the ANC policy room and what that ANC policy room and what the broad alliance can really, um, uh, can really grapple with in terms of compromising on past ideologies and perhaps merging them or morphing them into something more modern and market friendly, dare I say. Something that the minister sounded quite upbeat about was the fact that government will now be spending more than it ever has when it comes to uh, educating the young people of the country. Debo Haas, let me bring you in here and talk about what you think the impact of that is going to be. Already in this financial year, you know, spending on higher education has increased to about 46 billion, and that's uh, expected to hit 50 billion over the next three years. Uh, you see, I have a problem with those type of uh, narrative and even numbers because all that it seeks to do is to look at 
tertiary education. And when you talk about tertiary education, you talk about universities. And most of the times people come out of university with soft skills and not skills that are actually attuned to the demands of the industry of the of the economy. Whereas a focus ought to be more on the on the on the on the on the on the technical skills, mm. you know, the vocational skills that will prepare uh, the young, the uh, the the, the budding um, entrepreneurs of the 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 budding the young people for for the marketplace, which is not the case currently, and that is why you even find that there's an output of many graduates from university who end up not being uh, absorbed by the economy and they end up being unemployed. This is also an embarrassment in its own. But most importantly, also, I think government was also uh, coy to admit. In fact, it was a mere kappa of sorts to say. We failed small businesses uh, by the 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 the, the now defunct uh, loan guarantee scheme, which was meant to help small businesses, uh, you know, weather the storms or the hardships that came after the the, the pandemic uh, hit these shores. So, to talk about numbers of investments, we know that. And so what if you pump more money into universities or uh, for bazaars or NASFAS or whatever it is? It is the economy and that is driven by small business entrepreneurs that ought to be at the forefront of any investments uh, by government if we're going to talk about uh, structural adjustments of the economy. So, Tabo, are you saying that, that the nature of investment that government is making then into uh, skilling the young people of the country? Because in many ways, uh, you talk about tertiary institutions, but we know that a significant portion of that budget also ends up with FET colleges that by and large are highly subsidized by, by government as well. Are you saying that whatever skills, whatever money or resources that government is spending on skilling young people is not actually resulting in those skills being efficient for the marketplace? Absolutely. In fact, let me just, just to illustrate the point. If you take, for example, the Presidential Infrastructure Coordination Commission, they've got a show ready projects that were passed or that were passed or uh, gazetted, uh, I think, 12 months or at least 12 months ago. You would know that in, in a year or two or three, you are going to need this type of skill set. Let's just take the the digitization project, for example, you'd know that you're going to need uh, people who'd be able to assist government to digitize the records into, um, uh, uh, to take the manual records into digital form. Therefore, you're going to look into the market and say, what skill set do we need? Is the skill sets available in the market? If not, then you encourage students to take up courses or training or internship that will prepare them for such opportunities as they become open. When you're going to be rolling out a five billion or seven billion project in that regard, uh, then surely you have people who may be able to drive those projects. You've got the young skills who will then be able to to be up or to be taken up, you know, to fulfill the, the the opportunities that that will be ready for them to take. That is the kind of disconnect that we currently see happening, where you don't find that government it knows that we're going to be hosting the World Cup uh, in ten years' time. We're going to need to to build stadium we need fit as well as an order nothing sure. has been done to prepare them today for the jobs of tomorrow all right so we're going to continue our conversation get reaction uh, from our guests tonight on the medium term budget policy statement we'll also take a look at soes the finance minister says they can expect tough love what exactly does that mean practically we'll continue our discussion after this Unbiased, uncompromising, unscripted. Catch Politics Unscripted with Tolim Gambi every Sunday at 3 p.m. on Newsroom Africa. Our news, our views.
11 News at Prime, thanks for staying with us tonight. We continue getting reaction to uh, Finance Minister Inoko Dongwana's maiden medium-term budget policy statement. Political economist Daniel Silk, president of the SMME Forum, Debo, Debo Haas, and uh, Youth Capital's network mobilizer, Letiwe Nkosi, joining us for this conversation. So, Letiwe, let me bring you in here and perhaps get a chance for you to reflect then on this issue of increased spending for educating uh, South Africa's young people. Thank you so much. I think as much as it is important for there to be investment in the tertiary education um, space, equally important um, investment must be made towards basic education. As youth capital, we find that a lot of young people expense a lot of there is a lot of roadblocks whilst they are in high school um, to the extent that they don't even make it to metric and get the certificate they need to pursue um, to pursue a tertiary education, to go to an FET, a TVET. And so we shouldn't just look at the investment necessary for tertiary education, but also um, not neglect basic education to make sure that young people actually do make it, um, you know, over the period of, 12 years, or if they decide to leave school at grade nine, they leave school with a you know, certificate that holds weight and allows them to go to a technical college and acquire the technical skills that our economy requires. So I, I, I applaud the investment in tertiary education, but more work needs to be done as well in basic education. Daniel, I want to go back to a statement that you made earlier, and it was really about kicking the can further down the road. One very much got the sense of that when it came to the country's SOEs. We've certainly had a lot more um, specific statements made about uh, the country's SOEs in previous budget statements. Uh, today, the minister saying, well, we're not going to be giving them any additional support. Is that a position that government can really afford when we still don't have a clear idea of what the turnaround plan for SOEs is? Um, and that's just based on the fact that the last time uh, Finance Minister Ditton Boeni had alluded to the fact that some SOEs would need to be shut down, but we haven't seen any practical steps um, to, to actually doing that. Now, Kathy, you're right. It was a bit uh, uh, confusing, I must admit, on the issue of SOEs. Uh, however, having said that, if you analyze you know, the speech itself, uh, Minister Gorongwana did make reference to the uh, fact uh, that, uh, you know, there are some SOEs that we need and possibly, just like Minister Mbaweni did in previous days, uh, you know, government needs to reflect on what's essential. Um, so there was, a, um, there was a, a type of admission that some of the SOEs really perhaps should not be under government control, uh, which really reflects continuity with uh, Tito Mbaweni of, of, of last year and, and previous years. Uh, and I think we have seen some continuity uh, come forward uh, in the sense that by not propping up SOEs once again, or at least uh, indicating this tough love approach, that is continuity from uh, the Umbaweni era. It sends a message certainly to the SOEs that they've got to conduct their own uh, accounting uh, and uh, financing in a much more responsible fashion. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, government is going to have to decide what it believes it needs to hold on to and what it believes it can relinquish control over. I'm certainly of the view that the government should relinquish control over all sorts of, uh, of, of these SOEs that really haven't performed well under state management. But in the interim, the issue is funding, yes, but it's also the management. And we've seen for the last two days how the uh, management and procurement issues in particular at ESCOM have been dissected in the disaster that that has been in and has cost this country millions and has cost the poor and the youth millions as well as the minister made out. So look, I think he was fair. I have to admit, I think he was fair on the issue of SOEs. There's not much flesh to the bones of detail here as what government wants to do, but it goes back to my original point. I don't think that government really knows what it wants to do and I don't think it really actually has the full buy-in from all its component elements on what to keep, what not to keep, what to partially privatize, what not to privatize, it's a confusing message coming out of the state and in a sense that was related back to what was a relatively short and light speech this afternoon.
uh, Daniel, the, the point that you're making, I think, brings me to the idea that ultimately you, you have this ongoing stalemate, but the stalemate is not without consequences. The lack of clear direction has consequences for the workers of these SOEs. Danal is a clear example of a state-owned company that has been, you know, knocking at government's door, asking for a bailout. There seems to be no clear idea of, you know, what the future of Danal is. They move Moving from month to month, sometimes with salaries, sometimes without salaries. And one has to think about the consequences of that for the employees of an institution or organization, rather, like, like Danell. So this indecision is not without consequence. And like you're saying, it's been on the cards for a long time now. Surely, is it unreasonable to expect that there has to be some form of clear policy direction by now? Well, Kathy, I'm going to get old repeating these points year after year. Um, yes, you are 100% correct. Policy paralysis has been at the heart of uh, the uh, many, many negative issues about our broader economy and social fabric, I might add, in South Africa for many years. And until such a time as government comes with a cohesive policy where it has buy-in from all its component elements. Remember, you know, the ANC today is still a very divided organization in terms of its alliance partners. Uh, it's a tense organization. Uh, it's got all sorts of leadership issues and personality clashes. You've really got to come with a proper, concerted, full buy-in, enthusiastically so, you know, even on the issue of the Green Deal for that man matter on energy. Uh, you know, it's got to be embraced. It's got to be embraced by the ANC. It's got to be embraced by the Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs, I might add, before it can be implemented properly. So this lack of cohesiveness, I think, from the political core is at the heart of these issues. And that's why we've had such a sluggish policy implementation, uh, almost piecemeal policy implementation. It hasn't helped anybody. It hasn't helped our youth. It hasn't helped the unemployed. And it leaves us sort of, sort of in, a, in a no man's land, in a kind of limbo. And that's what I felt today. It was kind of a limbo uh, mini budget. Mm. Debho, let me get final remarks from you then on uh, the way forward. What does today's budget mean for uh, small and medium entrepreneurs who are part of your organization that you represent tonight? Uh, any sense of where to from here on? If you may indulge me, just for somebody who's just tuned in, by SOEs, we're talking about the dead horses that uh, uh, CEO of uh, Energy uh, company Eskom was talking about them, am I right? And all these dead horses are the ones who seem to be attracting all the money that should be ta uh, 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 targeted to helping small businesses uh, sustain themselves and be able to contribute sustain sustainability to the economy. Having said that, I still believe that government, as Daniel rightly put it, kick the can down the, 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 the road and see what happens next year. But that should stop. Government needs to engage industry. Government needs to lobby not within its echo chamber chambers. It needs to go outside its comfort zone and be able to talk to people who are out there who do the, the job on a daily basis to understand what it is that is required and be more responsive to the needs of society, the, the needs of the small business uh, 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 ecosystem, which is not currently the case. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe let's hope that uh, Minister Bodongwana will use this opportunity between today and the next budget speech next year uh, to, to reflect and consult widely and understand what needs to be dropped in terms of how government has been working and what needs to be introduced. And also, the Small Business Development Ministry itself needs to also be nimble-footed. It needs to also stop moving away from eco chambers that it seems to be uh, operating in and make sure that it engages deeply with society and without making it a political uh, animal. All right, Leti, I'll give you the final word tonight. Thank you. I share the sentiment um, that Deboche just shared about, you know, consulting um, everyone and, and making sure that the views and needs of every South African are taken into consideration as the minister prepares for the budget speech that he'll deliver next year. And on that note, at Youth Capital, we firmly believe that young people's voices need to be heard. When we speak about youth unemployment, we cannot do it in the absence of young people. And by that, we don't just mean, um, you know, simple consultations where young people are asked to give input without meaningfully hearing what young people have to say. So when young people gather, we encourage our leaders to 
be present, even allow themselves to show up in spaces that people have created um, so as to hear what young people have to say so that next year we don't find ourselves in a position where the issue of youth unemployment is not well articulated in the budget as we've seen in today's budget. Thank you so much. All right, let's leave it there for tonight. Thank you all for your time. Leti Wing, Gorsi, Has, and Daniel Silk. Well, let's continue here.